again. Um, a big warm welcome to uh, tonight's meeting, Policy and Scrutiny Committee for Children's Services, Education and Skills. Welcome to councillors, officers, press, and to members of the public. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, to start off with, we have no planned fire drills this evening. In the case of an emergency, you hear the fire alarm sound. Please treat this as a real emergency and evacuate the building via the nearest safe escape route. The nearest escape route is via the stairs to your left, which you leave the council chamber or the public gallery. Exit via the door at the back of the building, across the end of the car park to the evacuation point, pavement opposite the police station. Lifts can't be used in the event of an emergency. Please don't enter the building. Advised it's safe to do so by a member of staff. So item one on the agenda this evening is uh, apologies on the change of membership. Do we have any apologies? No, no apologies have been received. Okay, thank you. Uh, item two is the minutes uh, of the meeting that took place on the 4th of September. Do we have any queries about any parts of the minutes circulated? Okay, I have a proposer for those minutes, please. Councillor Downer proposes a seconder. Councillor Churchman, all those in favour of passing those minutes? And, um, abstention for Councillor Henry. I'll sign those. Okay. Uh, item three are there any declarations of interest from members who wish to declare at this point regarding the items on the agenda? Not already declared in their um, declarations of interests. I think if, if, anyone, if anyone's a school governor, it's taken for red that they've all declarations of interest. Okay. Before we move to item four, I just want to um, make an opening statement, really. Um, I'd like to thank our officer team, first of all, um, who've been with us since the 1st of February bringing forward the island education strategy. Never had one, there hasn't been one in place since 2021. So I know in, six, in under six months, you brought a well-written, well-presented education strategy, which we desperately need. And thank you very much, team. Obviously, out of that strategy, one of the key strands of it was identified as looked at first, the issue of, of place planning. And a huge problem, there is a huge problem, I'm sure will come out during this evening, uh, an excessive number of school vacancy places, which has affected the finances of both schools. Rightly an issue that you identify as the best. So thank you all for putting your paper together. There's a, this committee is a policy and scrutiny committee. It is not a decision-making committee. I just want to put that straight at its beginning. There's a lot of um, contacts I've had regarding, you know, we need to change decisions, and we are a policy and scrutiny committee. So we are here to scrutinise the process that's gone into the presentation of the Bay Place Plan paper. Um, the council is moving to a committee structure, but that won't be until May 2025. So the decision-making is down to cabinet member and the cabinet members uh, cabinet. Now I know, you know, I don't envy the position of cabinet members in, but let's be crystal clear, the decision is down to the cabinet member on how many schools, if any schools are closed at all, and the naming of those schools. I want to get it, yeah. So uh, we are here tonight to scrutinize the process that's come to the recommendation of potential closure of a certain number of schools. I think it's obviously a, a emotive subject. I want everyone to show respect to everyone around the room, from members of the public to councillors. We're not here to have a go at each other. We're here to do what's right for the young people of the island. And also the staff. I think the key part is also is the staff. Um, it was if, uh, potentially affecting a lot of children, potentially affects a lot of staff as well. And the, the well-being and HR support for those staff is equally um, it's equally as important. So this is a non-political meeting. I won't allow politics to be played this evening. Um, and it, say, this is about respecting each other and working together to scrutinise a process to address a problem on the island that is 
needs addressing. At our meeting in September, we um, welcomed the new education strategy and we welcomed the idea that place planning was going to be looked at uh, as, as a way of addressing the issues that were our new education team faced. So I'm grateful that we've got to the stage where you know, a paper has become forward um, now to be discussed uh, and uh, move forward one or the other. So that's where we are. I want to make that quite clear. I don't want to misapprehend that we can make a decision to change cabinet decision. It's the process we're looking at. Okay. I move on to item four, public questions. Now we have had uh, seven written questions for the public. Um, so first of all, um, if, 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 you're, if, if you've got a, if you've, um, put a question in or a verbal question later on, the microphone at the front, if you come forward and push the right hand button on the microphone, we don't have access to speak to us. The first question I've had is from um, either Mrs or Miss K Thomas. Is that person actually here? Okay, uh, we will arrange for a written uh, answer to that question to be sent. Second question I've had is from Miss or Mrs T Robinson. Do I have that person here this evening? Okay, we'll arrange for a written response to be sent to that question as well. Uh, third question I've had is from a uh, Miss or Mrs G Byrne. Do we have that person here this evening? Okay, a written response will be handed out. Uh, the written question from Nick Binfield is, is Nick here? No, okay, we'll get we'll get a written response to Mr Binfield as well. Uh, my third question, uh, fifth question, is from a Miss or Mrs. Uh, y Leopard. Is that person here this evening? Hello there. Could you, would you like me to read your question for you, or do you want to read the question out yourself? And you do have a right for a supplementary question after I read the answer to you. You have a right for a supplementary question as well. Okay. Okay. The question is for rural closures, there must be evidence to show that you have looked at the availability and likely cost of parents of transport to other schools and whether a proposal will result in unreasonably long journey times. If you continue with the plan to close three schools in close proximity, Godsill, Roxley and Arriton, leaving a huge schooling gap in the central rural area of the island, the lifelong travel costs that will, be that will be inevitably occur when a vast number of children have no local school would be considerable. Transporting large groups of key stage one children will need adult supervision based on age ratios. Multiple stops, traffic, plus parking time will mean earlier and more stressful starts for most children. Godshill Primary is on the main bus route with regular public transport, the other nearby schools do not. Can you provide the evidence you have taken all of this into account? And the response I have is during the pre-publication consultation phase, all of this information will be analysed and considered. This would include mapping children to understand if they are attending their most local school or if they are attending the schools due to parental preference. All the detailed information will be included and presented to the Cabinet on the 12th of December. Do you wish to have a supplementary, um, would you wish to ask a supplementary question to that answer? If you do, please come forward. Yes, Red, you're on. Hello. Um, yeah, so, uh, so it says that we are not in the process in order to answer that now, but it feels like we are in that process if it's been made public um, and therefore obviously the word is out there about the potential closure. Um, it does feel like that should have been answered before this process started. Yes, yeah, so Jade Kennett, Service Manager for Strategic Development. Um, so we are in the um, pre-public consultation stage um, and that stage is identified really to, to gather all of that information. Um, the closure proposals have not yet been formulated um, and it is designed to provide sufficient information for proposals to consider the various factors within that. Um, and 
and that includes looking at a various different range of, of sources of data. We, we know that there is a high proportion of children that are opting um, and families that are opting to travel to those schools. And so it's important that through that consultation process, we, we understand what those numbers are and the reasons why those parents are choosing to, to make those journeys. So that, that is the phase that we're in and that's the process that we gather. Thank you, Jade. Um, question six, I have from a Mr. K Miller. Is Mr. Miller here this evening? Okay. The final written question I have is from a Mrs. or Miss A. Martin Dale. Hello there. Would you like me to read your question out or do you want to read it yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Why are schools not being treated equally across the island? It is noticed a disparity in the treatment of schools across the island. It has come to my attention that certain schools, particularly those in rural areas, have been exempted from consideration for potential closure, while others, such as Godzill, in the central rural area of the Isle of Wight, have been placed under consultation. Initially, it was communicated that all schools would undergo review, yet only six were ultimately announced, with three of those being in close proximity to one another. This raises concerns about the potential creation of a significant gap in schooling for the affected area. The closure of a rural school would have far -reaching, could have far-reaching consequences for future generations of children and the local communities. In particular, the impact on border areas and, across, and access to education must be carefully considered. I kindly request that you provide clarification on the decision-making process behind the selection of schools, potential closure, and address the concerns outlined above. Okay, the response is, and you will get written, you will get this in writing as well. Um, the written response, the response is, school place, school place planning is a complex task. However, the engagement sessions, it was clear that the island requires a mixture of schools and sizes. And this includes a spread of rural schools particularly in areas that may leave vast parts of the island without any school provision. In some areas, the level of surplus isn't also as high as other areas, and therefore this, has to, this had to be considered as part of the review. In terms of assessment, the assessment criteria used, this is identified below. There's a list of criteria used. Quality of provision, where the children who attend the school live, children's health and well-being, whether the children that attend a faith school do so because of its denomination, financial viability, transport implications, environment implications, number of people choosing to attend the school, fabric of the building and ongoing maintenance costs, legal legislation, legal legislation restrictions, Department for Education guidance about rural schools, pupil movement, local housing building, Factors that arise during a consultation process and restrictions outside the local authorities' control. It is recognised that a number of schools within the proposal are defined rural schools by the Department of Education. The local authority will be clearly considering all the potential impacts to those communities during the consultation phase. Our key focus is on improving education standards and improving the life chances of our young children and young people by efficient use of resources, providing a broad and balanced curriculum offer, maximising staffing and maximising your school estate to respond to future demographic changes. That is a response that will be sent to you in writing. Do you have a supplementary question you wish to ask verbally? Yeah, I'd like to ask, we um, would like a bit more clarity on how that's been consistently used for all the rural schools because we have been told in a public meeting that some schools were too rural to close. I can't see how all them questions have been used and analysed correctly for every school that's classed as a rural school on the Isle of Wight. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think as the as the question, the response provides, there are a number of factors more than just um, rural schools in terms of how the um, process was reviewed. Um, and 
um, I, I know from being as part of that, uh, those meetings, that there was reference to certain uh, schools um, and the explanation was provided around the, the size of the area that that would leave if there was not a school provision within that area. And as, um, as noted through the engagement sessions, um, whilst some of those schools may have lower pupil numbers on roll, actually it was really evident that the um, community and parents' view was that actually in leaving a significant travel distance, and it is significant in one particular area on the island, um, without having that school provision there, that left uh, a, a void on the island without provision. And so it is, um, there are many fact factors around rural schools, um, and all of that will be considered as part of the consultation process. Um, but but keeping uh, a coverage and widespread of schools across the island is is important. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, how many have time? OK, um, I have a notification in advance of uh, two uh, oral questions. First question is from Mrs. Jane Hughes. So would you like to welcome? Could you like to ask your question, please? And you do have a supplementary after the response. OK. Good afternoon, Council. Um, my name is Mrs. Jen Hughes and I'm a parent representative of Oakfield Primary School. So my question is in regards to the school place planning. In the UN Convention of Rights of the Child 1992, Article 12 states every child has the right to express their feelings and wishes in all matters affecting them and to have their views considered and taken seriously. Given that this period of consultation ends in 14 days, and this is predominantly during half term, 12 days. Um, when will our children be given the chance to engage with the consultation process and have this right exercise? Because as of today's date, there has been no um, interaction between uh, the um, school place planning and the children that we are deciding the future of. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'll ask is I'll ask um, our director of children's services to answer that one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question. I'll start and then I'll pass over to my colleague, Jade. So in terms of collecting the voices of children and young people, um, if we go back several months actually to a um, period in April and May when we started um, engaging with members of the community across the whole island, um, there were conversations with children and young people um, at that point. So they were absolutely involved in those early discussions. And actually, um, we're confident that uh, in terms of the uh, education strategy, um, that the views of those children and young people uh, have been uh, reflected uh, in there. Um, and of course, the education strategy is the overarching holistic strategy um, from which um, the school place planning proposals have come. So that, that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is we have had very significant um, engagement um, as a, during this consultation process. I don't have to hand um, any statistics or data about how many submissions we've had from um, children and young people uh, in that. But when we um, sh uh, share the outcomes of the consultation, we will be able to um, include that information in that. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague Jade, who may have some additional information to provide. <coughs> yeah, so um, we recognise that actually in terms of feedback from children and the child's voice, it is really important. It's the most important voice in, in all of this. Um, and how, um, how that's managed has to be managed very sensitively, um, particularly if, you, uh, if we were to ask a question to a, to a child directly, um, the impact on that has to be considered in terms of the child. So um, Ashley, as Ashley referred to, we undertook a number of um, sessions with young people in various different uh, education settings, different sized schools, um, to understand their views, um, children that had been through change through the system themselves and how that impacted on them. Um, so that we really had to gauge an understanding about all of those impacts on children and young people. Um, we have all of that information collated um, and uh, that will formulate as part of, of this process. Do you wish to have a supplementary question? I thought you would. Thank you. 
Yeah, they do. Yeah. Let's just say also there's, there's no reason why children can't do the consultation as well. If children wish to take part in the consultation, then what, you know, to get their views on the system, they, they okay. can do. So my supplementary question based on that answer is respectfully, I don't feel you've answered my question at all. Mm -hmm. You've given April and May um, these consultations and all of this information you've collated. You've not made it publicly. You've not alluded to it at all. Um, but also it's now irrelevant. I'm talking about the opinions of the children directly affected by this place planning strategy. I'm, I'm not talking about the children that aren't currently affected. I'm talking about their views on your proposal to close the six doors, uh, schools that you um, want to close. Um, and there has been no um, engagement with those children and no clear um, pathway for those children to be engaged with. The questions you ask on the questionnaire that we've been asked to fill, with our points of, um, you know, of, um, of you, sorry, thank you, um, that we were able to put on that doesn't necessarily um, transfer to that of a child. It needs to be more child led. And again, with that in mind, I would say that every child has the right to express their feelings and wishes in all matters affecting them and to have their views considered and taken seriously. Now, that needs to be child led and it also needs to be child friendly. There is no evidence whatsoever. And I have engaged with people in other schools as well. This isn't just about Oakfield, who obviously I feel very passionately about. You haven't engaged our children in this process at all. And I really feel that you failed in your duty of care to those children whose futures are absolutely directly affected by your proposals. In, fa in fact, in our area, you're going to leave our area, one school on the east of Ride and four on the west which means every child that lives in the east has got to walk just under two miles on a 9.7% gradient to get to the proposed destination school. So I would really like you to speak to these children and get their views on it, because that's a lot of walking for a child from age four. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the question. Um, so there's a few things that are coming up in there, aren't there, around um, uh, suggestions about how far people might have to walk. So um, uh, in terms of answering that, and then I'll return to the point about children and young people. So um, when, when these proposals were published, uh, we had been um, asked by families uh, prior to those proposals being published to um, give as much information as we could about what alternative schools might be for children's children affected. Um, so with all the proposals, each of the six, we did uh, name another school where those children could potentially go. However, um, that would be up to the parent about whether they chose to go there. Um, and it would depend also uh, or would, fe would feed into that decision, presumably would be where they actually lived. So it would be up to the, 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 because parental choice plays a big part in this. Um, so the naming of those other schools was just purely an option, but, other, but parents may choose to do something differently. Just, so just in terms of the um, voice of children. So if I may just give one example. So at one of the um, uh, public consultation sessions, for example, at one of the other schools, we had we had significant representation from children and young people. Um, and indeed, when we um, started the Q&A session uh, in that meeting, we started off hearing from children. Uh, and there were a number of children there who expressed very articulately um, their views and what they felt uh, about their school. So um, I, I don't agree that there haven't been opportunities for children to um, be included in this process. And, and I do believe uh, that the voices of children and young people ha have been taken into account um, during these proposals. You want? Um, before we continue, we, we, we have run out of our 15 minutes for public questions, but I'd like to propose to the councillors that we just allow another 15 minutes for any more verbal questions that may come from the gallery. Are you happy to extend this by another 15 minutes? Have got any objections? Okay. Um, so we'll have another 15 minutes of public questions if, if required. Um, I do have another um, intention to ask a question from Sarah Butterworth. So Sarah, would you like to welcome? Hello, my name is Sarah Butterworth. I'm a parent of children at Oakfield Primary and at Ride Academy, and I'm here as a parent. Um, so I'm, I want to ask a question about engagement process in the consultation. I believe that a number of agencies and partners 
who work with vulnerable children who will be affected by the closure have been told that they are not allowed to engage in the process of the consultation in their professional capacity. Can you explain the rationale behind this and clarify exactly which agencies, organisations have been told that they are not allowed to share their views? Thank you for your question. So the consultation is open to everybody to uh, input into. Um, the consultation uh, has been widely publicised um, and uh, we're pleased with the amount of the number of responses we have, have had and the range of responses that we've had um, across a wide section uh, of the island's community, a, a wide range of people who care about the Isle of Wight. Um, in terms of any um, individuals or organisations being told they're not they're, they're not permitted, um, that's absolutely not true. Um, there, I think you might be referring to um, something that happened where um, someone contacted the council uh, to ask for, for some particular information uh, that was uh, not in the public domain uh, and wouldn't normally be put into the public domain because it related to uh, other schools. Uh, and I, uh, there was a, a case that I'm aware of where um, uh, that was then interpreted uh, as being um, a council employee saying that they had been told not to share information as part of the process. Um, if you're talking about something else, I'm not aware of what that is, but I'd be happy to look into it. But just so we're absolutely clear, um, no one has been told that they can't um, share information. You know, but it is the case that if people contact the council and ask for information, uh, which for whatever confidentiality reasons is, is not normally shared, then we would ask for it to be submitted through a freedom of information request, um, and then it would be shared if appropriate through that process. Sarah, do you wish to ask a supplementary question? Yeah, I, thank you for your answer. I, I wasn't actually referring to that situation. I'm not aware of that where somebody had contacted the council. I'm talking about organisations who work to support the children. So at Oakfield, we, we've got 40% of children have a social worker, have early help provision. And I believe that our head teacher has been told that people working in those professional capacities are not able to take part in a con consultation. I don't mean people on their own. They've been told, yeah, you could give your own point of view. I'm talking about people, for instance, could a social worker who works with supporting children respond to the consultation in their professional capacity as a social worker who supports children who are impacted by this? Thank you for the supplementary question. So, um, so we need to be really careful when we're um, quoting data about schools. So. I think what you just said was that 40% of children at Oakfield have a social worker. So, so it's, well, it's not true that 40% of children at Oakfield have a social worker. And I'm aware of... An, or, or early help support through Bernardo's. Well, mine was, well, okay. So I have seen, or, or ever. So <laughs> I think the point is that we need to be really careful when we are quoting data about this situation um, because I have I, I am aware of information data that's been quoted that is not accurate not true and it's misleading and um, it causes greater anxiety um, within the community uh, on a subject which is already very emotive. My question um, wasn't about the data though can I'm you ask what I've Asked about so just just the, hang on a second the professionals and their and their yeah. capacity to respond to I'll, I'll, I'll come to that but but I think it, it's it's really important I'm sure you'd agree that if we are quoting data we need to be or or actually any facts about what's being proposed or not I mean I'll give you if I may give you another example of something that's been uh, shared around uh, people have been suggesting for example that the council is proposing class sizes of 45 but this is just not true. So we need to be really, really careful when we're sharing data and quoting data that it is true. In terms of, in terms of, it, it isn't a question sorry, about okay, data, sorry, really. Excuse me. I'm not. Can, can you just let this isn't a debate? He's changed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking you. a question about data. I'm okay, asking I'm, a question I'm about professionals you engaging in questions. Please. Can you just let Mr. Whitwood yeah, give the explanation, and, that, and then we'll, we'll move on from there? Okay, it's not a debate. It's a question. You both raised a very valid question. I just like to. I'd really like to hear the art. I'm sure data will come out for some of our questions anyway this evening. Can you just yeah. allow? If you just answer the question, yeah. 
So, so it's absolutely the case uh, that all professionals can participate in the consultation. Um, the papers, the cabinet papers were published on a Wednesday. And first thing on the Thursday morning, I held a meeting with um, all the senior leaders in our children's social care department to make sure that they fully understand, understood the proposals, to make sure that they understood specifically which schools were affected um, so that they could make sure that they were both um, considering that in the work that they, the ongoing work that they do every day with children, young people um, and their families. Um, and that so they were aware um, dependent on what Cabinet decided to do the following week, on the following Thursday, that they would be able to participate in the consultation. And so it's absolutely the case that the consultation is open to everybody. And if you have specific examples of people, I, I'd be pleased um, to be told about that um, because, because um, it, it, that should not be people's perception. Uh, I certainly have not been involved in any conversations uh, about uh, any professionals not being allowed to contribute their views into consultation. So if you have views, I'd be really pleased. I think you've got my contact details probably. Do, do feel free to email me. Thank you. So I might just add one point to that, Sarah. The, the council does numerous consultations, as you can appreciate. There's no filter in the council's consultation system that will put anyone at all through a consultation. In fact, you know, every, in every response will be, you know, will be considered depending on where, wherever it's come from. So there's no filter in the system. So as Mr. Good if, if any, if, even if you know anyone that's been told they can't take part in it, I, I'd like to know as well who's been told they can't. Thank you. But that's the end of the... Uh, I've got no one else indicated they wish to raise a verbal question. Are there any more questions? I see two hands go up. Hello, Peter. Good evening, Peter. And you. Peter Shreve, presently Assistant District Secretary for the National Education Union on the Isle of Wight. Um, I have one quick comment, if I may. Uh, with regards to the local authority, uh, I do have sympathy. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Uh, my question revolves around mitigation. And I quote from the LGA report that is on your agenda. Um, it does, however, state in this report that mitigating action will be needed to make sure the council plan succeeds and the least possible disruption to pupils is held. Um, and I have a deja vu moment because I was heavily involved supporting members and, and indirectly students uh, when we had the last reorganisation leading up to the 2011 change of a three to two tier. I was in so many meetings with employers and also the local authority where I heard, yes, we'll do this. Yes, we'll support members. Yes, we'll do that. Yes, we'll do the other. And the reality is, uh, with hindsight, very little of that came to fruition, which is perhaps why we still find ourselves in the situation of um, education needs to be improved. So my question is, I, I know we're starting to look at that, uh, but do we have any further details we can share about mitigation now? And, and well, anything you can share uh, would be very welcome. And of course, I will ask it in the meetings that I have regularly with various people in the authority. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the question. So uh, the key thing, isn't it, that actually no decisions have yet been made? Um, and so no firm decisions about how any change, if, if it is agreed to proceed, um, will be managed. However, of course, there are many key principles which one would apply in this situation. Um, and of course, we understand the you know, deep emotional attachment that, that children have uh, with their schools, but not just children, also uh, their families and, of course, the, the entire um, staff team. So it is a difficult situation. And thank you for referring to that and the difficulty of this whole process at the beginning of your question. Um, there would be um, a lot of transition planning that went into it. Um, transition planning, which is done on a regular basis already when children are moving, for example, from an early year setting into primary school, or when children are moving from a primary school into a secondary school, or when young people are moving from secondary school into 
post-16 education or, or whatever it is that they're, they're doing after that training. Um, so that, that's the key principle of it. But what's it also a key element of that is distinguishing between the different needs of children. So we know that some children will adapt to change quite readily and quite well. Um, we also know that some children require much more structured transition support. Um, and so what would happen is that the local authority, in conjunction with the schools, so the schools from which the, where the children are currently, but also the schools where the children would be going to, which at the moment we don't know where that would be, and we don't even know, obviously, for sure which schools would be closing. But we would expect there to be communication between the local authority, the school where the children are now, and the school where they are going, to plan on an individual child basis what support those children needed um, to go through that process. Um, and um, you know, my expectation would be uh, that the staff in, in those schools and certainly the staff um, within the local authority would work together as a team um, to plan and implement that transition in a structured, ordered way. Um, so, uh, and they would have some months um, in which to do that. So they, they would be the, the, the overarching principles. I don't know if any colleagues want to add something to that. But until we actually know, um, you know which schools, uh, if any, are to be um, you know, moved to the next stage, um, and we also then need to understand so you're subject to parental preference and school of place availability, et cetera, um, where those children would be going to, it's difficult to be more specific um, than, than what I've already said um, on that. I hope that uh, gives you some information that you're after. Peter, we're looking at, yeah, supplementary, Peter, yeah. First again? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought red was off. Um, <laughs> forgot what I was going to say now. Yes, um, I thank you for your answer, Ashley. Um, it, it's kind of the same answer I heard 13 years ago. And I hope that's not an unlucky number. And that's all I wish to say, other than I look forward to hearing more as, as time goes on. Thank you. I believe there's one more hand for the last question of the gallery. Oh, sorry. Yep, I will allow the second question. Yeah, okay. Hello, Sahara King. Hello again. I've seen most of you several times. Um, I just want to go back um, to Sarah's question, actually, about the data. Um, you've made several references tonight and um, Councillor Bacon's made several references to the press about data being wrong. Um, according to the Office of National Statistics and the Isle of Wight Maternity Service, your data is wrong. Yeah. So you in this proposal have said that the declining birth rate is at 48% in the Isle of Wight. Every other organisation makes it 10. Is this 38% a prediction for two years when five years it's gone down by 10 percent how are we to believe that in two years it's going to go down by 38 i don't see how that's logical and quite frankly it's very misleading it's not transparent it's not open and honest which is what we were promised at the start of this process it does not show an accurate rate and on top of that in the proposal itself, in the glossary, as I mentioned at our school meeting, it says that the data has been taken from vaccination rates, not birth rates. Now, birth rates and vaccination rates are two very different things. And according to the NHS across the country, not just on the Isle of Wight, vaccination rates since COVID have fallen through the floor to the point where their stock on the Isle of Wight it has cost over £7,000 to destroy excess stock because people are not vaccinating their children. How can this data be used to justify closing our children's school when it is inaccurate and misleading? There is a 10% decline. Where is the 30 out? Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, so um, we had this conversation at the uh, consultation event and we've asked for that data that you are referencing to be shared with us. Got it, um, yeah. If you could please email that in as we... I already have today. twice. Um, and we, we will investigate as to how that's sourced. Um, just to provide some context to that, 1,077 
primary school started school mm -hmm. this year. So the numbers that we are reflecting are actively in our system now. Yep. We're forecasting that drop, um, as we know, to drop to 970. There is no increase in birth rates. Um, and our information is based upon birth rate data mm -hmm. and not on vaccination data, as again, as we have responded to yourself and clarified. So the figure for 970, that's not a prediction. That was from uh, 2022 and was at its lowest. This proposal goes up to 2027. And early years provisions before um, for children born after that year, so not being taken into account in this proposal, have gone up. Um, so thank you, Jen. March 2023 meeting... Scrutiny. Policy and scrutiny, 2030. Yeah, so to, so to confirm, we so take it our... It is going up. So childminders, nurseries and early provisions across the Isle of Wight, including a um, childminding meeting not a week ago, were offered cash incentives to extend their working hours and to take on extra children because of the boom in birth rate. <laughs> and may I also point out that at that meeting someone from the local authority, who I will leave to you to deal with, actually sat in that meeting in front of everybody and said, when these schools close, and that this proposal process and this consultation is a tick box and exercise to shut parents up. Yes. Now, I'm sorry, okay, that is just, conduct. Can I just stop you there? I think you made some good points. I'll, I'll add you a bit of latitude on the follow-up question. Can we just let those points be answered? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So, so again, if you can share that data through, we will review that and provide a response to that. In terms of uh, an increase in uh, uptake of early years provision, um, I can hand over to my colleague, Teresa. Um, there, the, there has been an, an uptake in terms of the number of parents opting, but that's because of the changes to funding. But I'll hand over to Teresa to provide more information on that. Hi. Um, so, as you're probably aware, there's a new entitlement that has come out for early years. Um, so now children from um, under the age of, well, from nine months and under, they can now go to an early years provision. So there are more children in the early years provision, but the birth rate is still going down. Those children are already here in the system, those children. Um, I, I'm not aware of a child minder meeting that you're referring to. If you can send me that information, that would be brilliant. Thank you. So those children are already in the system. They're already, they've already been born, those children. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Some good points. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I will allow one more question. The gentleman put his hand up. I will allow one last question, then we're going to move on. Yeah, Jen. yeah I, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm a parent at God's Hill. Um, I've been to numerous meetings with you, with you guys and yourselves. Um, look, I, I just want to understand something. So before uh, publishing proposals for discontinuous or rural primary school, which God's Hill is, is designated as Section 16 of the Education Inspections Act 2006, just requires a local authority or governing body must consult certain persons, including parents, and where the LA is a county council, the parish council. Can you just confirm as a council that every element of that was complied with these results? Because as far as we're aware and concerned, we found out at the same time as everybody else. So it's not pre-public, that's public. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, so again, I'm aware this has been uh, asked as a question and a response has been provided to that. Um, closure proposals have not yet been formulated and we are in the pre-public consultation phase and that is designed to provide sufficient information for proposals to appropriately be considered um, and, and all of those factors be, to be taken into account. In terms of the uh, pre-public uh, pre, um, publication phase, all registered parents of pupils at the school and the parish council have been consulted um, during this process. So in terms of that legislation, I can confirm that, yes, we have complied with that. 
you wish to have supplementary questions, sir? I'm just not sure how when you're in consultation or being put into consultation, that's not pre-public. Mm. Pre-public's before it gets out to everybody. Yeah. 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 I, 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 think, I think that's a chat or some meetings mm. beforehand mm -hmm. and not to the public domain like you've done it because you've put people off potentially applying for these schools. And, mm. and that's what you're doing. You're now putting them schools at risk. Mm. That if they were to be, if they were to be successful and and stay open, uh, they're not going to have the people coming through for the next year. So you put us at risk. That that's just the simplicity of it. No one denies that you can't you can't continue overspending. And I'm not st standing there saying continue to over over overspend. What I'm saying is do it properly. Thank you. That's uh, all I'm asking. Thank you for. Um the question and the supplementary question. So um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read the report that the Local Government Association have, have written uh, about what's happening on the island, um, but they make the point, um, I think, very clearly in there um, that there are certain elements of the process um, which the local authority is not in control of. So the local authority follows the process which is laid out in statute, basically, um, and uh, as they say, it is a consequence of the process that when you enter this this stage that we're now in, um, that some there will there will be some actions taken both by parents but also by members of staff um, because they will they will act in what they perceive to be their best interest and they make the point that um, whilst the local authority has the statutory duty around managing the number of um, school places uh, in their in their area. Um, there are certain elements of it which they're not able to control. So I think what you're alluding to is the fact that the local authorities is following the statutory process that we have to follow. Um, and it is a consequence of that, that there will be information put into the public domain, which results in some people taking some action, whether that be families deciding to move before any decisions been made, or indeed uh, teachers or, or other support staff choosing to move. And there's, there isn't anything the local authority can do about that other than to emphasise the point that um, decisions have not yet been finalised. Um, so I think it's, it, it's, I think your question is linked to the terminology that's used um, to describe the different um, sections of the process which the local authority has to follow. Uh, yeah, I agree, but that's, the, that's, the, that's all I can work on, is what you, what you put in your document. Yeah, so terminology say how you like but that's what we have to work with didn't really answer my question um but i'll leave that to you guys and you guys can scrutinize a bit more thank you very much i kind of thank the public for coming and giving your questions this evening i know it's a uh, it's, it's difficult it's a tricky subject so i do we do welcome all the questions um we'll, we'll, we'll open up to councillors now who will scrutinize the process and the policy disrespect you know let the councillors have their say and hopefully we'll, with more information, we'll come out as we come forward. So um, item five is obviously the school place planning. I know that I'll, I'll give the opportunity for Ashley on just to introduce, uh, briefly introduce this to us, and we'll open up the councillors for questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to say a few um, uh, things before we start, if I may. So just to emphasise the point that the Chair alluded to um, at the beginning, um, we, we absolutely recognise that this is a very difficult topic it's a very sensitive topic we know that schools play a huge part in in the communities that they serve not only for the children who attend them but also for their families um everyone who works in the school volunteers in the school and, and the wider community we, we absolutely understand that um and you know there's deep emotional attachment that people have with schools uh, and, and we absolutely understand that this is a very difficult situation um and that's why we ask that people talk with compassion and kindness at all times. You know, we're, we're in the middle of the consultation process. There have been um, examples of where people haven't spoken with compassion and kindness. And I'm very grateful that everyone this evening um, has, has, has stuck to that key principle of talking with compassion and kindness about this very difficult decision. Uh, and it's difficult for everybody. Um, so just so we're clear about where we are in the process, we're in the consultation. It, it's live until the 1st of November. Um, and what will then happen is that the um, outcomes of that consultation, the outputs of the consultation will be will be collated, put together and shared. And there will then be uh, sorry, they'll be shared internally uh, amongst the, the council uh, and with 
um, uh, elected members, uh, as the chair said, that the decision uh, will be a cabinet decision. Um, and the papers, the relevant papers will be published on the 4th of December. Uh, and there will then be a cabinet meeting on the 12th of December when cabinet will um, decide uh, what to do uh, going forward from that. So um, we really welcome this uh, extra discussion uh, about uh, the proposals. We've had very considerable interest uh, from uh, a, a wide range uh, of people who care deeply about the Isle of Wight, not just from schools that are specifically named, but from many other schools, uh, and indeed people who don't have direct link with schools, but just have a view and an opinion about education on the Isle of Wight, because really this isn't just about specific proposals, it's about the bigger um, situation we have on the island uh, relating to uh, education outcomes, and that is why uh, these proposals are a subset of the wider education strategy. Um, we really welcome um, you know, all this debate, and we've had lots of people who have uh, uh, taken the time to come along and share their views and opinions in face-to-face -face meetings, but also complete surveys, email in, write in, hard copies, email, etc. So we've had a, a wide range uh, of input, which we're very grateful for. Um, two other things, I wanted to draw people's attention to the um, local government association paper, uh, which was published on Tuesday and was submitted as a late item for this committee. You may or may not have had time to read it. Um, the main section of the paper uh, is relates to the proposals that were published in July. So they looked at the education strategy uh, and they looked at the uh, draft school place planning strategy, which was published and considered by Cabinet in July. Uh, and there's an addendum which relates specifically to the proposals which were considered by Cabinet at the beginning of September. So if you haven't had a chance to have a, a read of that, I, I really recommend it. Obviously, the consultation is still open. Um, so if you, haven't, if you haven't read it and you want to submit views after that, then please do. Or if people would like me to pull out some points, I'd be very happy to do that as part of the uh, a part of this evening's meeting. Um, the other thing I wanted just to um, remind people of um, is the fact that what we're talking about tonight is something that's going on in council chambers across the country at the moment. And coincidentally, some of you, if you're involved, you might be school governors uh, or involved in schools in another way. You may be familiar with a weekly publication called Schools Week. Um, and interestingly, um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, Schools Week, which is a very, it's one of the biggest, I guess you could call it a trade magazine for schools. Um, they've actually done a, a particular feature uh, on the impact of falling roles uh, on schools. I thought it was just worth, um, we could circulate this um, after the meeting if you want, but the point basically it's making um, is that across the country, um, the, these are challenging issues and, and they, they're giving examples from London, from Brighton Hove, from Kent, uh, from uh, West Yorkshire, and in, actually the Isle of Wight gets a, gets a mention in there, and, and Lincolnshire. And it's talking about how, um, you know, across the country, people have been addressing this for, for several years. They've been closing schools across the country for several years because of falling roles. Um, and they also talk um, actually about how local authorities are using some of the building capacity that is being um, freed up by, by this process um, to meet the needs of the children in their community. Because the Isle of Wight is not alone in experiencing a significant fall um, in birth rate, but also a very significant increase uh, in the numbers of children and young people who have special educational needs and disabilities. And we are not the only um, council that is considering how we can use um, buildings to increase the provision uh, for children who have special educational needs and disabilities. Um, so be pleased to circulate this with the minutes afterwards so people can read that and it, it gives some interesting national context for it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ashley. Um, councillors, there's a covering um, covering paper to the actual paper itself, which does actually indicate some areas where we may like to scrutinise. It's not um, definitive, but it does cover things like data and bits and pieces. I'm sure we've all got loads of questions that we wish to ask. So I propose we just ask one question at a time, go around and then we'll, because some question might ask the same from other people. So um, who would like to ask the first question? Councillor Lever. Thank you, Chair. Um, following on from some of the questions, because 
um, I, I got a little bit wrapped up in the numbers and so I'm just asking for some clarity now. Um, so the report quotes um, 1,898 unfilled primary, primary places in October 2023. Do, do we know what that number is now and does that correlate with the projection? Yeah, so um, that was based upon census data, um, October census data, and October census data, and as again, we always like to use a year point when we're comparing the particularly the vast number of surplus places, um, because October is a, an accurate time where children have started school. Um, so that census has taken place. Um, as soon as we have that in and verified, we'll provide an updated figure on that. <laughs> but we do know in terms of the number of children that started, um, it was in line with the, the number that we had forecast. Supplementary? Yeah, OK. Rob? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just on a factual point, the LGA report that you referred to, paragraph 3.13, it refers to diocese plural, so Catholic and Anglican, as decision makers. Um, just want to point out that we're not decision makers. Um, we're consultees. Um, we have a right to appeal, obviously, but just want to point that out that that's factually inaccurate. Um, so I think if the committee could note that, that'd be helpful. Um, then if I could just pick up on one issue, um, there's plenty to talk about, isn't there? But um, something we talked about at the public consultation meetings about the sort of conflation of the future of school sites versus the decision around which schools are being named as potential closures. Um, from my perspective, I think it's, it's unhelpful if if the way that that's uh, communicated can suggest that a school is being considered for closure because its site could be suitable for SEM provision. Now, um, the future of church school sites, for example, is, is down to the trustees of the site, not the local authority, so you don't have that gift. But um, I just wanted some clarity around the decision making for which schools were chosen, which ones weren't, um, because it can come across that it's linked to the SEND strategy, which I know is important to address. But for me, the closure of a school should be around surplus places, demographics, where people live, that kind of thing, not about the school site. So could you just clarify that, please? I'll let Naomi answer in a second, but just be clear, the repurposing of any site that's closed has got nothing to do with the Bay Place planning. Uh, if those sites are available, and I don't know, name of explaining, but the, the, like the SCN, you mentioned SCN specifically. The SCN provision has got nothing to do. If with, I, if I could that's just, a different strand of the actual, of the, the, the yeah. strategy, SCN is a different strand to be addressed within that strategy. Absolutely, but yeah. they're in the same document. Of course. I'll let so that. it gives the impression that they're linked. That's the, that's the problem. I, 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 I get the, the implication maybe they're linked, but I'll let Naomi, do you want to? Can I, can I um, thank you for the, for the two questions. Um, so just about paragraph 3.13, um, I think the report, I, I absolutely accept what you say. I think what, he's, what, what they're saying, though, um, is decision makers in the broader sense rather than decision makers about closing schools, because he's also, or, sorry, they are also talking about national politicians, for example, who are also not. I think he's talking about decision makers in the wider education context, but I, I accept that it, it could be interpreted differently. But uh, I think that that's basically what they're saying. Yeah. Um, in in terms of the the send, I mean, the chairs um, helpfully um, clarified that point. Um, the reason the reason uh, that um, in two cases there were specific things raised is that when we were engaging with um, uh, the community back in April and May, um, what people were saying. Uh, they were well. One of the things they were asking was, "What would happen to these sites?" And so they were asking us, if possible, to give some kind of indication uh, about what the site might be used for in the future if it were to be closed. Um, and um, that is why, in in two cases, um, you know, we were specific about what we felt they could be used for, potentially if. The first stage of the process, which would be around resolving the issues around school place planning, um, progressed. So I, I, I accept that some people may uh, have interpreted that differently, but that that's the reason we were asked to be as transparent and open as we could be 
about what might come of these sites. And some of the discussions we had was, um, if you have a situation where you have a very rapidly declining child population, and it's very hard to imagine a situation where there's going to be enough children to sustain a school, what the communities were saying to us is, what alternative use could be found, which actually could bring some longevity to that site, that could keep it within the education estate for the benefit of island children. And so that was part of the thinking about why we included um, some proposals about uh, how we could repurpose sites um, for the benefit of island children in the future, but absolutely subject to stage one of it being, you know, resolving the school place planning situation, which is the most urgent situation. So I hope that's brought some clarity to it. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. So just to clarify, that's got absolutely nothing to do with the decision for selecting a particular school, the nature of its site, nothing to do with it. Councillor Churchman. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to make the point that the whole of Europe is now suffering um, from lack, lack of children, for want of a better phrase. The, the statistics show that the whole of Europe is now plateauing out as regards population figures. Um, if we ha are having problems here, goodness knows how bad the problems are in places like Surrey, Kent, which are much, much bigger than us. What I wanted to raise was in your calculations and everything else, have you taken into account the buildings involved, the school buildings? First of all, are they old and fit for purpose? Do they have the facilities? For example, I'm fortunate Haylands Primary is a brand new school virtually. But how many of the schools across the island, whether they're included for closure or not, actually have proper facilities for libraries, playgrounds, uh, parking amenities? Because all these things are important are we going to be shutting schools, possibly, that in fact are either fairly new or have good facilities, but keeping old, keeping open old buildings? And if we keep open old schools and old buildings, what is that going to cost in maintenance and repairs? To me, this is, has to be part of the mix. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you raise a, a very valid point. Um, we're very fortunate on the island that in terms of the work that was undertaken with the Department for Education, we've seen significant investment in the, across the school estate. Um, and we've had a number of our sites either rebuilt or refurbished due, um, under the um, school rebuilding, uh, under the Priority School Build programme. We also have a number of our schools um, that we were successful in bids to uh, rebuild under something called school rebuilding program. So there is a continuation of that investment within um, from the Department for Education into the school estate, which allows us to um, invest our capital funding that we receive each year, um, which is a much smaller pot. Uh, funding into school estate and make sure that that is spent efficiently um, but as part of our criteria the buildings is is one of those um, in terms of one of the the smaller um, criterias around suitability sufficiency access to sites um, we know that our primary special school for example is um, on a very constrained site and has had to um, utilise existing accommodation which was available on uh, sites that had previously closed. Um, that's created a number of constraints for us, particularly around how those children are transported to that site. Um, those children, some of them that access that satellite provision um, have to be transported via bus to the main site and then access a minibus round to the next site. So we're aware that within the school estate there are absolutely still challenges to overcome. Um, uh, I've overseen the, the school estate side of that for, for many years, so we know the school estate very well and know where the challenges are and know where further work is needed. 
a supplementary cancer downer. Yes, uh, with your proposals and, and uh, how well you've, uh, Bob, the, sorry, I do apologise. Yeah, with your proposals and, and what you're thinking about doing, about closing schools and that, by making classes bigger, might this not push more of the children that don't cope into requiring a plan, ultimately moving to home education or special school status? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Councillor um, Downer. So we have, um, you know, we're going to work with families and school communities should this decision go ahead. Obviously, um, we have had a lot of parents that have said when we've been at consultation meetings that, you know, home education would be an option for them. And we need to work with those families and those school communities affected. Um, in terms of the class sizes, we have the infant class size regulations and we want to go above that. Uh, and we tend to stick to that. Uh, number within our other schools as well. What we need to factor in is that our school system is funded for, you know, 30 in a class. That's the optimum number. That's what we work within. And that then provides us the resources to be able to put on the school um, curriculum that we wish to deliver. So we don't feel that at the moment the um, class sizes will go above that. We'll be working with schools around that. And we know that should the proposals go ahead, we we'll have to work with schools that are remaining in terms of the transition of pupils, uh, specifically if there are pupils that have certain requirements and uh, we want to work with families around that. Supplementary, Rodney, do you have a... Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, many have indicated to me they do not want to fight to send their child to a faith school. Uh, what alternatives have been um, discussed? Is there not if there's a long way away from a faith school, from a from a, an alternative school? I do apologise. Thank you. Yes, so faith is um, something that can either be a strong preference that parents opt for a faith or that they they don't choose that and that is a parent's right um to to choose if they they don't wish to to attend that as it's a parent's right to send the child to uh, um, a school or not the local authority can't insist on that um in terms of uh faith provision across the island that is something that we'll be reviewing as part of the consultation process to understand um what parents view views are on that on the each individual circumstances um, and at the individual consultation events we did actively ask parents to come forward so that we're aware as part of this process if there is a strong view against um, or for then then we're able to take that back and consider that as part of this process thank you chair uh, what i was sort of trying to say is that if people didn't want to send their their child to a faith school and the, the, the alternative school was a very long way away, that's going to have transport implications and also all the exhaust fumes going out into the atmosphere. It, it could. Exhaust fumes are, uh, are an interesting topic, um, particularly um, as you're aware from seeing the dot maps and what the, the travel distances that we already see the number, significant number of parents already traveling across the island um accessing school provision out of uh their either immediate area or what we class as their their closest school um that that is something that we are looking at the data and information on in terms of um potential impacts of closures um but in terms of of faith if there is a strong um view around that then we would need to consider that as part of our um, consultation process. There isn't, in terms of statutory position, there isn't a statutory position that the local authority have to provide a place for parents wishing to have a faith provision. Thank you very much and apologies to uh, the meeting for my bungled questions. <laughs> Thank you. Very good questions, Councillor Downer. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Chair. In the draft Island School Place Planning Strategy, which was released in July, the recommendations were to remove 330 school places, 11 classes. However, the Isle of Wight School Place Planning proposal, released in September, recommends 195 places to be reduced. Why is there a hundred difference of 135 places since July? Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, when we looked at the data and the information, um, we, uh, as I referred to earlier on, we, we are aware that actually, because of the level of travel across the island, making um, and proposing closures of schools in certain areas, actually those, those because of that travel distance, we, um, we needed to understand the impacts. So for example, if a school was closed within the Newport area, what would be the impacts in um, Sandown and Shanklin or other adjacent areas? And so from when we reviewed that data um, and information, there was an assessment made around an optimum number of schools that would be proposed for closure to allow the system to effectively settle and allow parents to um, opt for places back in their planning area should they wish to. Um, and also retaining a sensible level in some areas was higher. Um, and I use the ride area as an example where we know that um, potentially with the change in government as well, we're likely to see a higher increase in um, developments and so therefore retaining a higher level of surplus over what we would um, typically do of, of, of around 10 percent is what we felt was an appropriate measure to that. Do you have a supplementary? Could I just add though to that we do recognise that actually going forward school place planning is an ongoing topic um, and the, the way that um, we we know that we're going to have to work is work with cluster heads in terms of looking at planned admission numbers going forward to build a sensible system going forward so that if the numbers continue to decline, we can actively work with those head teachers. Ashley, would you like to? Thank you. Just to add uh, one more thing. So one of the questions we had earlier was around, uh, and, and it's what it says in the uh, LGA report about mitigations, because we absolutely acknowledge that this is difficult. So essentially, um, the more schools that closed at any one time, um, the greater increase in travel distance that would happen, and also the greater challenge to accommodate children that are in the in the primary school system within the surplus fast places. And so we believe that six is is also the optimal number at the moment, because what it does is um, when you look at uh, the increased travel distances that some family families may may need to uh, have uh, in you know, their children traveling to school. Um, it allows, we believe that that is an acceptable level. Uh, if you were to close more schools, then that travel distance would increase significantly. Uh, and, and second to that, we believe with six that um, we're able to accommodate um, the vast majority of children, depending on where parents choose to go to um, within you know, permanent classrooms. It may be that we need to have a very small number of temporary classrooms, for example. We don't know until uh, we see where parents want to go. Uh, but um, uh, you know, that's the other reason why, why six uh, helps with this mitigation factor of the disruption that we're causing to the education system in the short term to deliver long term benefit. It's around temporary accommodation and around travel distance. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just uh, really a comment and following on from these last two questions um, and looking at the dot maps, which provide a very visual uh, demonstration of where people are actually travelling from. Um, and also looking at anecdotal evidence we've got going around at the moment that people are already moving their children to another school or another area. Um, is it possible that this this whole procedure could actually end up in a net reduction of transport times one way or another, given the amount of people that are currently traveling from outside an area to go in and may there actually be put into another school which is closer uh, and one bus maybe, could we be looking at a reduction in CO2 emissions? Yeah, I, um, that we have a review currently underway of that um, and for the December cabinet we'll be able to provide uh, a detailed response to that as as you'd expect as part of that report um but actually yes in terms of that level of travel we are seeing a very high proportion of parents opting to travel um so uh yeah it was important that we undertake that assessment to, to review that thank you i think i'll ask the first of my questions actually if i may but i've got quite a few actually um i've been obviously i've covered quite a lot of um 
emails received as chair of the committee. I suppose my first question is: We've got thirty-eight primary schools on the island. Um, cabinets decided they want to they proposing to close six of those. Um, we've got quite a lot of certainly Roman Catholic schools on the island and some academies. Um, can you just um, explain? Have all those been equally considered as well as state schools and Church of England schools? I think uh, some of the feeling, like some of the comments I had were. We've not considered Roman Catholic schools as part of the process as thoroughly as state schools. So if you could just, you know, clarify that to us, I'd appreciate it. So um, the proposals have come out of a review uh, of the entire island. So all schools were included in that um, and the decisions um, have uh, been derived from that wide range of factors which uh, Jade articulated in one of the responses to one of the earlier questions. Um, the point about um, academies, um, and this has been well uh, discussed publicly and in, indeed the, the LGA report, the Local Government Association report covers it as well, is the fact is that it is not within the local authority's power um, to close an academy in the same way that it is within their power um, to close uh, maintain schools as part of their statutory duties around uh, managing the number of um, school places, making sure that it's appropriate for the size of the population. Um, that, that is a fact. That is a product of national um, education legislation policy. Um, I have written to the Department for Education um, uh, in the early stages of this consultation because of the volume of feedback we had from our community about that. Um, and I have a meeting with the Department for Education together with the lead member and, and colleagues um, uh, in the first week of November to talk to them um, uh, about that, that fact. So there has been some speculation about whether government will change that policy. We don't know whether they will or not. They probably won't change it quickly. If they do, they might do, uh, but we don't anticipate that being, being a quick move. Um, and uh, it's it's important that the local authority takes action uh, around this issue uh, and we have to take action using the tools that we have. And the fact is that we don't have um, the ability to close academies unless the academy, the, the those trusts put themselves forward for closure uh, or the Department for Education uh, had, um, decides to take action. And we have had. We've had. Um, plenty of conversations with the Academy Trusts uh, and with the DfE about this topic um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. I don't know if anyone wants to comment more or comment on the faith uh, point. I mean, we considered all of the schools and worked um, worked up different solutions different around the islands. And this for us, this was the most optimum number of schools in those areas, regardless of faith or none. So that was uh, uh, ultimately why those schools were put into the paper. So basically, the faith schools were considered exactly the same criteria as state schools through the whole process. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Lever first. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, just kind of related to you, um, when we talk about parental choice and travel and things like that, uh, and just recognising that due to many factors, not all parents do have the same choice as others in reality. Um, has the socio-economic makeup of areas been considered up to this point in the process to mitigate against the less well-off communities being disproportionately affected um, by school closures? Yes, yeah, so as part of the equality impacts needs assessment that will be undertaken um, on the individual um, proposals, um, that will detail and include all of that uh, assessment as you would expect it to do. Um, so yes, the answer is to that, all of that's been considered. Thank you. And, and I guess on the back of that, um, just look into some indication of a plan on how any disparities in the in those impacts can be mitigated so that less well off communities aren't disproportionately impacted. That would be great. Councillor, if, if I may just add something to, the, to that um, answer as well. So I think this is an example where I think we need to remember that the proposals are part of the holistic education strategy for the island. You know, children who have additional challenges in their lives are best served by attending an earliest provision or a school provision or, or a post-16 provision, which is high performing. Uh, and at the moment, what schools are telling us is because of the 
decrease in the numbers of children because of the impact that's having on their funding because it's per pupil they don't have the money to invest and deliver the additional support that some of these um, children and, and families need so because the aim of the strategy is to drive up the education standards on the island we believe that a higher performing education system will actually support these families more than it does at the moment it, it will reduce the very significant gap that we have and, and it's articulated very clearly in the LGA report the very significant outcomes gap between children who have additional things going on in their lives from lower socioeconomic groups and those from relatively wealthy families you know we have we're very we have very significant differences in those outcomes that is exactly uh, one of the things that the education strategy is looking to address because we believe that all children should have equal access to a, a high quality education. Um, so we believe that that, that is um, you know, a, a really important part of the strategy. If I can also add, um, uh, in addition to the education quality aspect of it, just a, just a financial aspect of it, we need to remember that essentially what's happening at the moment is that the council is underwriting all the debt in the school system. Now, if that debt comes to pass uh, by a school closing, which inevitably schools will close because they're, you know, and some of them are already financially unviable, um, that debt is inherited by the council. Um, if and when that happens, uh, that debt will become part of the council's general fund. That general fund is the pot of money that the council has to pay for our early help, our children's social care. And so by doing this, by taking action, sorry about the squeak, by taking action, what we're doing actually is protecting the amount of money that we will have as an island community to invest in those early help, those children's social care services. And if we don't take action, what will happen is that debt will grow, it will be inherited by the council. And when we sit in here, you know, every February, March time, listening to, to the budget, we will be having to find savings which given that you know, 65, 70% of the council spend comes from children's social care and adult social care, that is where it will have to be found. And so that is not in the best interests of children uh, or families who need that extra help. So that is another reason why it's urgent for the council to take action uh, on this point. Interesting. That's the judgment. Yes, a quick question. Um, I haven't seen anywhere we talked about academies. Oh, OK. I'll try. Um, do, do we know if academies have um, falling falling school roles um, because I'm not sure I saw anywhere in here which shows which academies are under thing. There you go, have a go. The other thing I wanted to ask was, and um, please, Gallery, do not make comments. For example, braiding are very much part of the social fabric. Now, I don't know if that applies to all schools, but I'm very concerned that because they are what they are, and many village schools are like this, then what will that do to the local community? And it's such an important thing because I don't know if you know, in Germany, schools are part of the social fabric. They, the schools are open to meetings, venues, etc. Our schools, normally the head teacher goes home, locks the gate and that's it. And I think this has got to stop, but that's another thing. But as I said, I'm very concerned what will happen to not just the children, but to the whole social fabric. Thank you. 
I think there's two parts to the question. The first one, in terms of academies, all schools on the island are affected by the falling roles. So all schools are affected by that. Uh, we do have, as is already being acknowledged, um, movement at the moment because you know parents are opting for that. Um, but we we have seen falling roles across all schools on the island. Yeah, so in, ter in terms of uh, community use of, of buildings, as we, we term that, in terms of schools are more, more than just education provision, absolutely, that, that's, that's key. Um, and we are gathering all of that information as part of the consultation. Um, particularly for rural schools, we've been engaging with the head teacher of the schools to understand what are those buildings used for currently, what uses is, is that. Um, so that all of that information can be gathered as part of this process. Um, but we do recognise that there are school sites that have um, uh, food banks that support families, other facilities that, um, th that they, uh, and support services that they may host on that school site. So this is what this process is for, so that we can actively engage with communities to understand all of those facilities that um, are, take place on them. Uh, Councillor Hendry. I'm staying with academies. Um, in September, the Cabinet report point 26 says the strategy should be school type neutral and there is an ex expectation that the DfE will be a proactive partner if academies, academies are to close. With no academies closing, does that mean the DfE was not a proactive partner or was it just simpler to close non-academy schools? And if we didn't have any academies on the island, would we still choose the same six schools to be closing? So the DfE have been an active partner, but they have no um, powers to work with the work with us in terms of closing academy schools. If all schools on the island were um, maintained schools, there would be an additional school in the um, proposals. You should follow up, Stephen. Uh, Rob. Uh... Thank you, Chair. Um, for me, I think when accepting a difficult decision, um, the sort of trust in the process is a really important thing. Um, you can accept a tough decision if you can see the clear rationale behind it, um, even though it might be difficult to accept. <laughs> and what I'm hearing from stakeholders is a need to be reassured around how the criteria that you've listed have been applied with perhaps a bit of great clarity. Um, for example, you've listed a number of criteria. There are a smaller number in the opening and closing maintained schools guidance, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, what I'd like to know is whether the criteria in that guidance perhaps were more heavily weighted, because that's what's in the guidance. Um, it's not a limiting list, I recognise that. So were the criteria weighted? Was there like a matrix put together where each school was scored against each criteria and then there became some obvious choices? I think it might help to understand that process a bit bit better to understand the choices. For example, um, you know, standards has been referred to quite a bit. I can understand that, absolutely. Standards can be improved though, can't they? People moving to different places is, is more difficult and more troublesome. Um, some schools that are destination schools are still under requires improvement. Some of their data is still in the red. But some schools have been named as closure candidates because their data is in the red or they're under requires improvement, but so are some of the destination schools. So it, for many people reading that report, there seems to be some inconsistencies in that. So I'm just wondering whether there's any way of being offering some great, greater clarity on the process for how criteria were used. Was there a scoring process, that kind of thing? It just helped to understand that. Just before you did, just remember the officers make recommendations. That the names of the schools is not they're not decision makers. That's down to the cabinet to make the decision on which schools are actually in the paper for potential closure. The officers make do all the make the recommendations based upon the data. Just to be clear on that. Okay, so. Re the recommendations. Yeah. So. Um, so you'll be aware that uh, we undertook some engagement sessions earlier this year because actually we felt that the island is in uh, some areas quite unique. Um, in other areas, uh, we fit the, the national picture. 
Um, but we felt that actually prior to us entering into this process, it was really important that we had the parents um, and the community's view about actually when we're going to enter into this process, what's important and how do we play um, plan our school provision across the island. Um, and the two clear criteria um, that, that was voted on within that, and we had a high number of responses to that, um, and therefore that was quality of education and travel distance to schools. And so um, in answer to your question, no, no exact matrix would fit every area of the island because the area, each, end, each planning area of the island has unique situations. So the surplus in some areas is much greater than others. Other, some areas have more rural schools. Some schools actually have a very um, a high number of schools in close proximity to them. And so actually um, a, a one size fits all approach doesn't, um, doesn't fit to that. The information that was provided in terms of the summary of document provided a summary as to why those schools had been identified. Um, and we recognise that education standards can change. Um, and uh, since since this is published, obviously Ofsted ratings has has been um, are no longer used, um, but they are still existing for schools. So we know that historic trends um, of what, uh, school's academic performance um, exists. And so we have a good understanding of that. We also have another um, layer of data behind that, behind just um, the, the data that is published within that. Um, and that's things such as the dot maps um, that, that we refer to in terms of locations of pupils. Um, and so all of that information was put into an assessment um, and those were the optimum schools. Now, this is what the consultation process is here for. Um, it is to understand, um, and you'll, you'll be aware because you was involved in the West White process, that actually proposals are only ever put forward. Um, and therefore, we actively encourage the public to come forward with alternatives based upon additional information that they will know as part of their communities um, and par parents and families involved as part of that. Um, and it's right that they have their input to that as part of that consultation process prior to us getting to the statutory process, which is where we formulate the consultation notices um, and we are defining that as a proposal. Um, so, does that answer your question? In terms of the individual areas, if further information is requested in terms of that, we have been providing um, responses to, to parents alongside that, um, as and when it is requested. You wish to follow up on that, Rob? Okay. Um, Councillor Downer, you're next on my list. Thank you, Chairman. Um, hang on. Oh, hang on, what was I going to Crikey, let me just look. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it, on your list of schools proposed to close, some have, have already been uh, indicated about repurposing. Now, why haven't all the schools been uh, looked at about repurposing if they're going to close? Thank you. And when will we know about that? In terms of um, the repurposing, we have uh, we've got to consider the capacity of the team and um, plan that out, you know, properly. We don't want to have communities that are uh, looking forward to or, or you know want a facility there, but we can't deliver on it. So what we've proposed is that we have five repurposed sites um, from the six if that if this goes through, but we need to work through and do feasibility on some of those too. So we've got a lot more feasibility work to go through. Should um, the decision be taken. Hey, yes, of course you may. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Accommodation. Um, so if you had a, a closing some of these schools and you you had to repurpose uh, through uh, mobile accommodation. Now, the question I would like to ask is how long is that going to sit there before they have proper classrooms? 
So if we are required to put modular accommodation on onto school sites, that would only ever be for a temporary period. Um, and that that typically would be for the upper numbers within the school system that we're currently seeing. So that was at the point when the birth rate um, was higher. So we do have year groups typically across the island in four, five and six in our primary school system where there are higher numbers. Um, we know as those numbers work through that that temporary accommodation will no longer be needed on those sites. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Emily. Yes, um, my question is about admission numbers against PAN. Um, looking through the proposals, some of the schools are showing that they're taking over PAN um, in go going forward. Um, and th is this putting unfair pressure, taking away students that could go to um, nearby schools? And how do you propose to kind of mitigate that? I know we have parental choice, but if a school is publishing a PAN of um, 20 yet in the proposals it's showing that they're going to be taking in 30 when another school in the area is under pan um, shouldn't something be shouldn't that be relooked at and um, children redistributed or, or or encouraged or helped to for these schools that are you know not necessarily are not filling up their pan when they could be thank you so um, we would, in, in terms of um, schools with planned admission numbers uh, such as 20, typically those schools have accommodation to admit to 30. Um, those redu re reductions across the island have generally been made because of lower numbers. There are some examples where schools have already reorganised um, and accommodation has been removed from site. So it's, it's, it is varied across the island. In terms of them taking above a a typical planned admission number of, of, for example, of 30, admitting to 31, 32, we would only, um, we would not encourage schools to do that. The only instance where that would happen um, typically is where if there isn't place in an area and those parents have accessed that through an admissions appeal process or potentially a sibling. Um, but it isn't the, the approach of the local authority um, to admit above standard pans of 30 um, in a class. Do you wish a supplementary to that? Um, I'd like to ask a question, actually. We've, we've, I mean, we've talked a lot about proposed six schools and the impact on the young people. Um, but remember here that if it, assuming it is those six schools that are, are chosen, I think there's like 270 members of staff in those schools and I think we've talked enough uh, or there's enough content in the paper about you know the well-being and uh, and care for those I think it's 270 I think added up from the schools I saw on the websites there's 270 potential staff who are impacted by this and I think we need I'd like to know what plans are will be to look after those you know our excellent school staff but look after those as well as the young people but there's 270 staff affected by this potentially so our numbers at the moment are 210 um, and we're working with the HR providers for the schools and our own Isle of Wight HR uh, team and we have a full package of support. We have offered um, numerous um, additional support, so mental health first aid training for the schools, mental health first aid trainers to go into the school, as well as um, other um, support mechanisms. Our HR team are doing drop-ins at the moment, um, so I know that uh, one of them was at Oakfield yesterday speaking to staff. Um, about whatever issues staff bring to them and we will continue to do that. When we started the process we put out a document with all the signposting to uh, various support mechanisms, well-being, uh, mental health support, that sort of thing and we made sure that we were checking in with the head teachers on a regular basis to ensure that they were okay. Uh, we've had um, contact with them on a regular basis and we'll continue to do so and we are working closely with the unions uh, where we have fortnightly meetings to well-being. Can I, can I, thank you, Naomi. Can I just add um, that um, the, the numbers of staff needed to you know, educate children is a function of the numbers of children. Um, and because the school system is funded per child and, and it assumes a class of 30, um, you know, the, the, the reality is, and it's, you know, we need to be transparent about this, in, in an education system on an island, 
where the birth rate has decreased. And I, I accept that we, we, we need to be clear about the data we're using for birth, but the data we're using, which we believe to be correct, is that over um, eight years, since September 2018 through until September 2027, the numbers of children starting reception will have gone down 38%. So it, it is, you know, um, uh, you know, not possible to have an education system uh, that employs the same number of people. Um, so th there will be some people, you know, where, who, who won't be able to continue working in education. Let, well, I think we need to be honest about that. Um, and though there are opportunities um, for staff, uh, whether they be teachers or support staff, to either move to other schools, because what, what is going to be happening is that um, children will be moving, depending on what Cabinet decides to do in September, to two different schools. Those schools may need to recruit additional staff. So I would anticipate that there will be staff who, who will move to those schools that actually will, will, will be expanding. As, as Jade said, you know, there are a number of schools on the island that might have a published admissions number, which is significantly below the physical capacity of the school. And so if children are moving to that, they, they may need to recruit staff. In addition to that, we know that we need to expand the number of special educational needs and disabilities places that we have. Um, and the studio, and uh, studio school is an example of where there, there is recruitment in the education sector. So some of those colleagues may be interested in you know, taking their career forward in, in the area of special educational needs and disabilities, which is a sector um, which is expanding and recruiting. Uh, and I'd add to that um, that we, within the wider children's services workforce, we have many colleagues who work within, for example, our, our social work workforce who are ex teachers who bring huge transferable skills and for those colleagues who wish to retrain and reset their career within the the area of, of social work um, there are really strong opportunities uh, for that through uh, apprenticeships for example and training opportunities on the island where they can qualify as social workers in a relatively short period of time uh, and we'd be we delighted to see applications from colleagues in schools you know if their schools end up being in this situation who, who would like to pursue a career in that um, and um, so we, we need to um, face up to the reality of it if you have a birth rate that's declining this much there will be uh, less of a need for the same number of, of, of staff in these schools we are do I think a lot to support colleagues we absolutely recognize that this is you know very difficult uh, time for them uh, and we're also working to make sure they're aware of what, what the opportunities um, might be some of which we're, we're more in control of um, than others Thank you. Councillors. Okay. Right, I'm going through my list then. Um, I've just got a few, a few little questions. Firstly, um, transport worries me because obviously um, I know we've got a, a, a robust transport policy, but our transport budget, I might say, is already well overspent on the Home to Schools transport. Um, it, it, there'll, there'll be a I know it was mentioned there might be a saving. I, I think it would be more an, an extra expense on the transport system. Um, are, are there, is that doable within the current policy or does it all need re, 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 re looking at again? So, yeah, transport is well something that we're currently assessing. And then, and as you'd expect for the cabinet report in December, those calculations of estimates of what that potential financial impact would be. Um, in terms of actually defining what uh, children would be eligible for home to school transport or not, um, it is something that is an exact science purely because of parental preference. So if a parent opts to choose a school which isn't their next closest school, um, in the example of them being eligible, then they wouldn't be eligible for home to school transport. So. Um, we can't presume that all parents would opt to take the next closest space to that school. Um, and also, just um, in terms of uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the figures that we're currently working through, um, as an example, the 99 children on Royal Arriton, only um, 17 of those is, is nearest school. So it's around how we look at those numbers um, in terms of would those parents be eligible for that home to school transport or actually are those families going back to 
to their um, closest school where, to their home address. Actually, yeah. Chair, but, but can I add also that um, if it is the case that our transport spend increases, we need to see that in the context of the financial situation of the primary school system. So according to the school's latest forecasts um, of their financial situation in the current financial year, this, across all primary schools on the island, the school's latest forecast, which was published as part of the school's forum uh, papers in July, um, the, the primary school system will spend £2.6 million more than it receives in income. So in terms of quantum and the quantum of the debt that the council, if it doesn't take action, will inherit in the future, and that, that in-year spend, that in-year overspend is increasing, if, we, if the council does incur a larger uh, spend on home to school transport, it needs to be seen in the context of the financial risk that it could, well, that it is running and the financial position, the debt that it may inherit in the future. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to see it in that context. And, and it's true, as, as Jade's explained, we, 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 we have, there's a high degree of uncertainty actually about what that would be. Um, because we don't know exactly how things will play out. My next question, really, I, I wasn't going to talk about specific schools, but I am aware that Cows Enterprise College are currently running their own consultation about um, taking on as feeder schools, uh, Honey Hill and Cows Primary. Cows Primary is one of the six schools potentially up for closure. And I, I think their consultation runs until 14th of November rings a bell to me. Um, does their own individual consultation, would that supersede what the Cabinet may or may not decide about Cows, Cows Primary School? In a short answer, no. Obviously, we've done the um, naming of schools in this consultation process, and we have spoken with the multi-academy trust, um, Ormston, and have had reassurance from them that they are working with us to support the school system during this process. They, 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 their consultation doesn't uh, won't have any impact on the consultation we're currently doing. No, and I want to make that clear because obviously it's confusing for parents who may assume that that will, um, you know, affect this process. But um, we having we have gone back to Ormston and challenged them on that around the um, consultation. But they have a process to run themselves. Uh, we have this one to go through, and obviously this is the um, this is the main process we're running at the moment. And they have said they're going to support with that. That's Henry. Um, quick question about what happens next. So on the 4th of December, we get the paper release and on the 12th of December, it goes to Cabinet. Is it possible that a school which is not being named at the moment can then enter the mix of schools that can close? Nice and simple. Yes, is the answer to that, because absolutely, um, as part of the consultation events, we've been encouraging alternative options, um, viable options around the reduction of surplus places. Um, we've widely spoke about how um, in previous consultations we have opted to, um, to, to consider those other um, factors and actually implemented them. Um, so we hope that as part of the engagement with the, with the community that um, we will receive alternative options in as part of this. Do you have a follow-up to that? Can I ask a follow-up to that then? If um, the decision will be made by Cabinet in December. If the if there, if, there, if there becomes a different preferred recommendation, i.e. another school or less schools, I assume, I assume that there will have to be then another statutory period of consultation in the new year. And with PERDA coming up for the elections, would that really cause a problem timing-wise for potential closures next August? Um, so the answer to that is that, yes, we would need to run a, another consultation on that um, stage one. So um, pre-publication stage, effectively what we're the stage that we are in currently to obtain views or, on that as a proposal. Um, uh, the PERDA period is something that, that we're factoring in and we have a meeting set with the monitoring officer to look at what the timetable would be um, should turn to viable options come forward that, that should be considered. So if, if it was to close less 
if it was to close five of the original six, for example, hypothetically, would that need new consultation or only if a new name comes forward? No, so they, they are treated as individual consultations. Thank you. My one final question, if I may. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Rob. I was just going to ask a quick question about planning areas, again, just for a bit of clarity. Were planning areas considered in isolation or in uh, as the island as a whole or grouped? The reason I ask that is because looking at them, I don't know how they're determined, um, but there's a planning area with just two schools in Ride Rural, for example. That would be difficult to consider just two schools um, in one planning area because of small numbers. Um, so was that planning area considered at the same time as, as Ride Town or was the whole of the East White looked at as a lump versus West White? I'd just be interested to understand how that was looked at. Thank you. So the answer is it was looked at as a whole island um, and we had to look at it as a whole island due to that parental movement that I reference um, um, because that is so significant that it, it if you looked at this as individual planning areas, as it was originally proposed um, previously, we uh, you could effectively resolve the issue in one area and then it move on to another. So it was important that when we started the review, we we removed the fact that the, there was any planning areas to be considered as part of that, um, and it was a whole island approach. You have a. I suppose I, I ask that because the the report. I suppose quotes numbers per planning area, so it makes it look like that, that was how it was done. But you're saying it wasn't done like that, um, done differently. So we're required by the Department for Education to have planning areas. Um, that that that's guidance that is set by them, um, and our data is set also by planning areas. However. Um, all of our forecast data includes something called a participation rate. So whilst we forecast the number of um, families and children living in that planning area, we also factor in a rate um, over a three year average of typically the number of children that are um, opting to take places up within those schools. Um, so our, we have to report that as individual planning areas. We could have done that as, as one overall approach, but it would have been consumed into um, to, to one whole data set and would not have been easy to read or to digest. Um, Your note from the uh, summary document that we actually started with an overall summary that this was an island review um, and that it was undertaken as one. Councillor Churchman. Just a quick question. Penny Feathers at Ride is supposed to eventually have roughly 850 houses. Um, and we're talking about Oakwood is on the list. If those houses are ever built, please God, <laughs> um, would it be possible to revert the school back into a primary school? So the... Um Housing developments uh, across the island um, is an interesting one. Uh, typically, build out rates are, are low on the island. And we do actively track that with our planning department on a quarterly basis uh, to monitor the, the housing trajectory and the numbers of developments that are actually being built um, and occupied. Um, what we do know is that there is we have um, something called a yield factor that we are able to calculate for the number of housing developments. Um, so as an example, within the ride area, we uh, know that there's approximately 890 houses with um, uh, applications approved. The definition of um, two, a house of two bedrooms or more, we forgot that factor, but on the basis that that 890 houses was built, that would yield approximately 222 children. And that would be across the primary school. So that wouldn't be 222 starting at reception age. Um, that would be 30 children approximately in, in each of those. Um, and so that's why I referenced earlier on about us retaining a higher percentage of surplus places in some areas. And actually Ride is one area where we are anticipating that, that level of development. 
um, and penny feathers, um, particularly um, as, a, as another de development on top of that. So um, with the forecast birth rate data, we know that within that um, there is sufficient accommodation. Um, and we also looked at, um, as you would expect us to do in terms of future developments of sites so that should birth rates increase or should housing developments increase and migration to the island um, also go up then we would have capacity to build additional facilities on our school sites. We should follow up to that, Vanessa. Are you happy? With Can I just add a point that I've heard Jade make uh, in the past, which I think um, councillors might be interested in, is that often when new houses are built, it doesn't actually result in an increase in the overall population. What it results in is people moving from one place to another. And whilst we would we would be delighted if we saw significant in-migration onto the island, um, at the moment we actually have mild net out-migration from the island. Um, so th that's the other thing is that although the, the housing development might yield that number of children, it, it may well be that those children actually arrive there from somewhere else. And that's another reason why we have to have a whole island approach when we're when we're modelling the numbers of primary school places or all school places that, that we need to have. Uh, my final question, I suppose, is um, just your assurance to every um, response to the consultation will be Probably read any alternative, only any alternative solution or option will be properly evaluated. And assuming if, if cabinet do make the decision to close six schools, that your newly formed and still forming team has the capacity. I know you've still got vacancies. We're trying to who has the capacity to actually deliver six closed schools. By next, I, I know the experience of doing with the West White, the amount of work involved is well a lot. So if it does go ahead on December, have your team got capacity to deliver that by next August? We're currently recruiting. We believe we have got the capacity to do that. We've done this so so, so far. Um, and actually, uh, we've had full council support for any behind the scenes work that we need. So we've been very lucky in that every team at the council has been incredibly gracious with their time. And uh, we, we wouldn't have put proposals forward if we didn't feel that we could deliver on them. And just to emphasise what, what Naomi said, this is a council priority uh, and um, it, it's being prioritised as such. So we're, we're able to access resources from across the council. In fact, um, you know, colleagues from across the council are already very involved in it. So in terms of it being finance, modelling, um, the, the future financial situations in terms of the, our colleagues in the human resources department helping, in terms of colleagues from the transformation team, um, this this is a, a whole council effort. Uh, it is an example of where people are coming together um, as one council to deliver this important priority for the island. Um, in terms of um, all the information being considered, um, what we're planning for uh, is that the uh, cabinet papers uh, will include uh, a confidential section, uh, which will be all the submissions um, that the consultation has received. So the cabinet members will be able to have access to all that. They'll have time to read that and reflect on it. It won't be made public because obviously people who have written in on the consultation wouldn't expect necessarily their views to be to be published. Um, but it is the case that the decision makers will have access to that full range of information. They will be able to see uh, you know, ev everything that's been submitted uh, as part of that cabinet information. Is that possible for this committee to see that confidential information as well or not? Uh, we'll, can we come back to you on that? I mean, I, I don't see any reason why not. So we had a discussion about whether we should go through everything and redact and publish everything, but we felt that actually the degree of redaction would be so significant that it, it would, you know, wouldn't be practical. Um, but I, I think for this committee, we can we can look at a solution for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more of this floor saved? Any, any more questions from councillors or governors or no? Um, Rob, so it's one quick. It's a five. It's a five pound fine. Thank you. Um, there's more a concern, I think, raised by 
people it, it, uh, when talking about this whole process is the concern around whether this is going to have to happen again in a few years' time, um, because obviously it's very disruptive to children, families, staff, etc. Um, so I know you potentially can't give reassurances about that because it's not in your gift to make the decision. That's a political decision, it's my understanding. Um, but what's the degree of confidence in this not becoming an endless rotation of processes and consultations that's just going to be really upsetting and unsettling for everybody? Obviously, none of us have got a crystal ball. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't think many of us want to go through this process again. What we do have to do is we have a sufficiency duty for place planning from early years right through to schools and we will work in clusters. We've identified that already where we will work with cluster groups of heads to remedy any issues moving forward. If we get it right this time round, uh, we hopefully will be able to then work in a much more uh, targeted way moving forward. One thing that's not been referenced this evening is attached to our papers, remember, is uh, letters from the, all the chairs of governors on the island and head teachers asking the council to do this process. I think, you know, the, I believe 34 heads on the island requested to the officers that this process was undertaken. I think that, that the letters are in the, are in the pack of documents we've actually read. So, you know, it, it, head teachers were well involved in the process in this, you know, a year, a, a year ago. So that is important to note as well. You, I mean, if there's no more questions from the floor, yeah, your members' questions, Michael. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to sort of summarise from this evening? Or, I mean, we, we could get are there any specific actions we like, and we've raised all the queries and the questions around, you know, well-being of everyone concerned. Are there anything else we would wish to raise to be looked into, or are we happy that we've? Okay, is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Um. A couple of things. Um, so first of all, there is a frequently asked questions section uh, on the council website within the section around school place planning. So that's being updated on 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 a regular basis, um, and and we'll we'll update that as as a result of this meeting to reflect the questions that have been raised. Um, and secondly, um, just to say thank you very much for for all the questions. Uh, we are all working towards the same goal. That that goal is to um, improve education outcomes on the island um, and you know we, we really welcome the, the the views and opinions challenges that we're that we're getting um, you know during this process it's a difficult process but we are all moving towards the same uh, intended outcome which is to improve education standards um, on the island so I, I thank everyone for their engagement in this process thank you a final message to councillors and to anyone you speak to in school you know, or communities, um, get them to do the consultation. Members of the public as well, you know, get people to do the consultation. There are no um, restrictions anyone doing the consultation. If officers will evaluate the consultation properly, you know, encourage people to do the consultation, please. Okay, um, we'll move on to item six, which is our work plan circulated with the documents. Our next meeting is. Uh, on the 5th of December. So, have any, any questions around our next work plan? Okay, so we'll move on to section seven, members' questions. We had a written question from Councillor Ellis that she will get a written reply to, I understand. That's, yeah, so we'll get it's, it's uh, along a similar vein. I think points in her question have already been covered in detail this evening. So, we'll get a written question out to Councillor Ellis. I promised Councillor Lily he could ask a um, verbal question. So, Michael, if you wish to ask your verbal question, please do. Please do. Uh, it is in relation, uh, Chair, thank you, uh, regarding the school place plan. Um, and actually, I'm putting my, not my local hat on, because I've asked a lot of questions locally and put my feelings locally, but my mental health hat on, uh, because I'm actually concerned about the mental well-being uh, of all the uh, schools involved and the people involved in this process, because 
people are still going through a cost of living crisis. They're still recovering from COVID. And in fact, we've got a very strong amount of COVID that's actually back into the community. Uh, a number of councillors uh, have been off because of COVID and a lot of staff. Uh, so we're still in the reels of of that and low self-esteem on the island was low anyway if you look at the various figures on mental health on the island we have the highest number of children that are going into services we have the highest number of children that go into um, hospital because of mental health uh, and side so i want to make sure that under the commitment of this council which is linked into the a mental health challenge which we signed up for some years ago that there will be as part of the final report a mental health analysis uh, sorry mental well-being analysis that any of the changes of the schools there is being looked into the same as you would look at the legal you look at the environmental the climate change the various policies that you do actually attune to that policy on the mental well-being. And my last bit of the question is, we know from the World Health Organization that walking to school is the best psychological thing you can do with children. And I would like to know from your dot maps, right, that you've actually got the data that will be made available on the numbers of children that walk to these schools. I think it's extremely important because some of the schools that are not listed rely very heavily on four by fours, taking children to those other areas from areas like Ride. And actually the important thing is we, would, we really need to be in a society that our children are walking to school of, of that. And also linked to that um, mental well-being is environment and green space. And I'm really concerned that Michael, we actually Michael. make sure that we look at the availability of the schools to actually have access to green space. That's my question. Thank you. That's about 10 questions in one. So no, it's, it, it's uh, actually uh, about uh, mental well-being. Thank you. I will allow, I'll allow the answer of that part of it, yes. So if I answer the, the first part of it, Councillor, thank you very much for raising the very important issue. Um, and as I said, we, we absolutely understand the very deep emotional attachment that children, their families and, and everyone who's associated with schools, whether they be um, staff in the school or whether they be other members of the community. And we understand that very deep emotional attachment. And we understand the, the great sense of responsibility that many people, adults, feel to serve those communities. Um, and we are doing um, what we can to mitigate the impact of these uh, proposals um, on our communities. And I absolutely acknowledge that, it, that it's difficult. And as you said, it's difficult for everybody. It's difficult for the children involved. It's difficult for the families who are going through this process. And it's difficult for uh, colleagues here and uh, as well as the staff in school. So we absolutely acknowledge that. What I can say to you, uh, and I guess it links to the question we had um, at the beginning from the from the uh, uh, person in the, in the gallery about, about transition for children. So depending on what Cabinet decide to do, you know, our commitment is to work with those schools um, that the children are at now, with those schools where those children uh, will be moving to and with our colleagues, not just in the council, but also across with the National Health Service uh, and those colleagues. And, and Naomi can maybe give a bit more detail about a specific programme uh, which has been planned for, for putting out into these schools. Um, and we will continue to work with staff through the offer that we have through our HR teams and by working with the other HR providers that schools um, commission um, to do what we can to um, promote positive emotional well-being uh, and mental health. So I think that's what I can agree to, um, is that we will include that in, in the next steps, depending on what they will be. And I think there's already um, a, a lot being done around that. Um, and I hope that gives you some reassurance that we are taking this matter seriously, that our colleagues 
um, from relate from partner agencies who who are involved in in emotional well-being and mental health are involved in this process, uh, and, and we're doing uh, as much as we can um, to support everyone through this. Absolutely. Do you wish to have a follow up to that? And to if I could still have the information about walking to school. Thank you. So that's the second part of the question. Um, so I think I don't know what exactly what data we have regarding regarding that. Jade can answer that. So your 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 request is that we provide that data as part of the report and the analysis in terms of the number of children that are actively walking to school. Yeah, we will in, we will make sure that that's included within there. Thanks for your question, Michael. Uh, in the spirit of fairness, any other councillor present wish to ask a question? As I've allowed Michael to ask a question. Jonathan, would you, do you want to speak at all? <laughs> I, I was poised and ready to throughout the meeting, but no one wanted to ask me anything. Um, thank you for the opportunity, but I think anything I say now would be repeating particularly what you and uh, Mr Whitaker have said earlier about this is an ongoing process. No decisions have been made yet. We are very much uh, expecting and welcoming alternatives that come forward. I would repeat the uh, concerns about misinformation that have been highlighted. And of course, uh, I'd have thought that is absolutely key to consider because any alternative proposals that do come forward, if they're based on incorrect data, then their value is diminished. So I would urge people to consider carefully the data that is being used and check it for its veracity and accuracy. Um, and a point that has been missed uh, not missed, but perhaps hasn't been mentioned as much as I'd hope in uh, today's meeting and some of the uh, consultation sessions, is just being conscious of that bigger picture. Uh, this process is part of the education strategy, which you referred to close to the beginning of the meeting, which is about raising educational standards on the island. We have very poor educational standards. We are at the bottom of national tables. We have to do something about that. Step one of that is creating the education strategy. And the important first practical step from doing that is to sort out our school infrastructure and school estate. And that's why we need we need this school planning process if we are going to be able to address place planning process if we are going to be able to address our educational standards on the island. That is the bigger picture. This is about doing the absolute best we can for our children going forward. Yes, there's a, Naomi referred to not wanting to have to go through this again. And I think all of us feel that way, um, whatever side the process we're on. But it is a necessary step. There is some pain unpleasantness that we have to go through if we are going to actually, in the long term, do the best for our young people, their upbringing and their futures on what will hopefully become a more thriving island as a result of this. Thank you very much. If there's nothing else, we'll just uh, close the meeting. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, members of the public, for coming this evening. Much appreciated. We will uh, close the meeting and stop recording. <laughs>